All right. So I guess we're all set to get going. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're having a good summer and enjoying the uh, reduction in the heat. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of administrative items, notification and confirmation that the meeting is being held by Zoom under the governor's executive order, granting authority for such virtual meetings. Uh, as you can tell by the recording, MCB will record these meetings and allow for local recordings and make such recordings available to the public. And then, of course, I'd like to welcome uh, members of the public attending the meeting and uh, we'll hold questions and answers to the end. And as usual, we would like to have the uh, questions and answers really surround what is what is in the, the agenda for the SAB. So first order of business is to vote to accept the minutes of the previous meeting, which was June 10th. Uh, may I have a motion? I move to accept the June 10th meeting minutes. Second. Uh, okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, well, the next is uh, the commissioner's update. Uh, a lot of this is financial and budgetary now that we have a final budget. So um, why don't you, uh, David, I'll turn it over to you and address uh, the closeout of fiscal 22 and then discuss what if, what if any funds will be reverted back to the Commonwealth. David, you're on mute. Okay, sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Great to be back with everybody. Uh, so I have some notes here. So yeah, our fiscal position remains very strong, uh, perhaps even over-resourced. Uh, the accounts payable period ends today on August 12th. So while we're close to final numbers, the final numbers won't be available uh, for another couple of weeks or so until the quote unquote books get settled. Uh, so at next month's meeting, we can have truly finalized numbers, but the numbers that you all got in your dashboard, that's going to be really close to what they, the, the totals on the spreadsheet, the numbers turn out to be. Uh, but again, there's some, there's some late travel. We'll probably have a few minor prior year deficiencies for some you know, extraneous types of things that are inevitable with $34 million coming in and out of an organization. So, um, so will any funds reverted, you mentioned, will any be reverted back to the state? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we revert funds every year. Uh, so that will continue. There was one thing that was unforeseen this year that because of a number of reasons we, we just weren't able to do. And like, uh, so that's 400,000 for a study that we had proposed to do, a utilization study. And essentially we, you know, by the time we worked through the issue, we just ran out of time. So. Uh, so uh, is that the uh, uh, assistive technology survey? No, no, that one's going forward. This one was a, this was PAC money. So this was prior year money from left over from COVID actually. It's actually two fiscal years ago that we had managed to, to bring forward. Uh, but there were various questions that we were very patient with answering. And because of, you know, because of the nature of the dialogue that we were having, we got to a point where we just couldn't spend it because it was just so late in the year. So what was the survey, David? Uh, it was going to be about our short form and long form. We were essentially going to have a third party administer that so we could get kind of like a, um, a base, like a starting point. Um, so now we won't have that. So now we're just going to, you know, we're just going to start doing it one by one. Uh, and we won't really have a control group, you know what I mean? So, but so, that's okay. So, so I don't know. So just back up. What would, the survey was on short form, long form. Maybe I'm not quite sure I'm following. 
Okay, so we were going to administer the short form that we've developed and the long form that we've developed. We were going to use the money to essentially jumpstart that, to like get a control group, to hire a third party company to go out and survey and deliver that survey. We, 509 had various questions about some of the questions. We addressed those, but by the time we had addressed those, we ran out of time and we couldn't transfer the money. And as a result, that will go unspent. Was about it, how much money was that? 400,000. Which sorry. account was that coming out of, please? What's that? Which account, I'm sorry to interrupt. Which account was coming? Was that coming out of? Uh, maybe 1,000. It I, looks I, like I, the 1,000. It's, it's state yeah. funds. It's, it's state it was funds. state funds. It was state it's funds. 1, Remember, it was from two fiscal years ago originally. Right. So, I understand. I just wanted to make sure I was correct in my assumption. Thank you. Yeah. When you say long form and short form, what are you referring to? The survey tools that we've developed with human services research, HSRI, the HSRI surveys, the two that we've developed. On what topic? So they're both a combination of demography and some rudimentary uh, questions that, I don't know, they're probably better suited towards like, uh, you know, they're high level, like educate questions about your education level, questions about your occupation level, questions about various other demographic questions. Are you married? Like things like that, very high level question we've provided you the surveys i mean we can send those out again i remember it okay yeah i i'm trying to be it was just a general overall demographic survey in well, short, the short and long term it wasn't like client short. satisfaction or anything like that no the short form is going to be administered to all it's going to be our registration process it's essentially how we're going to register all new consumers the long form is kind of like that but a bit of an expansion of it like it goes into a little bit more depth the short form i want to say is like 18 questions and if you answer all like the b questions it could be as many as i think 22 questions or whatever and then the long one the longer form i think is like 44 questions basically like double or something yeah no that thank you yeah i didn't remember it and i didn't remember that it was for the registration process. I know you've had multiple surveys happening the last two years, yeah. um, HSRI and, and a few others. So that that helps. Yeah. So you weren't able to to do any. You weren't able to. The whole four hundred thousand dollars wasn't spent. Correct. Correct. And again, remember that was originally not even from this past year. It was from the year before because it was PAC money. Now we got to pack, we got to bring that money forward because of COVID, because you know so many things shut down and there wasn't a lot going on. Um, but then when we got into this fiscal year, questions were raised about some of the questions, and there was a long, drawn out back and forth over it, and we ended up you know not being able to move the money enough, transfer the money. So uh, I don't know if you want to talk about the FY23 budget. No, I wanted to just, just make sure it is, uh, we're closing out 22. So you would assume that <clears throat> that 400,000 will be reverted back, reverted back and gone. The, the 2000 account was short by $665,000. Um, you know, a lot of that you can have some deaths or people, you, um, you know, they're, they're uh, because each individual is expensive, the Delta can be quite large. That those funds will be reverted back to the state. Yes. And then on the 3010 account, it appears uh, that the 22 actual over the guy is uh, underspent by. A million fifty nine thousand. What happens to those funds? Um, 
which column are you referencing one fifty a million fifty nine? So so if I take a look at the FY twenty two GA for you're on the spreadsheet, by the way. Do you want me to? Yeah, I'm on the, the I'm on the spreadsheet. So account thirty ten. The the FY twenty two GA was two million eight hundred and thirty one thousand five forty five. Uh, the year-to-date combined spending between the, the spending and the encumbrances adds up to a million seven seven two zero zero nine. So that reflects a million fifty-nine thousand unspent. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I would say there is: remember, there's two different fiscal years. This is what you're looking at there. That's the state number. But that's a VR, that's a Fed, those are federal dollars, which includes the match. So that goes through September 30th. So that we still have time. And there's but still I thought, I thought the 2 million 831 is the state portion. Okay, fine. But either way, we still it's still in process until the end of the federal fiscal year, which is September 30th. I think that's the question you're asking. My point is, for VR, we still have until September 30th. John, am I am I right or wrong? I don't know, John. You know that just as well, if not better than anybody. So, so in VR, yeah, we have until September 30th to spend the federal money, which uh, we have two years to spend. The state match, which is the 3010, um, most of it will will have to be spent by that, but some may be carried over. So that figure may not be accurate yet. No, it's, it's not. A lot of a lot of outstanding. I've I've probably approved. We probably approved several hundred uh, payment vouchers over the past two to three days. So that figure will drop uh, tremendously. Now some of those were approved, and then some some were approved for the full uh, encumbrance, and others were approved only because part you know only part of the encumbrance was uh was uh payment voucher you know a pv came in with just part of it so it's hard to figure out when until this is um so today is the last day to process all the payment vouchers so that we in september we'll have a better idea of how much it really is so we'll look at that that million uh better in in september but that's that's used to to meet our our match to uh, to obtain the federal grant. All right. So so in other words, for all the summer programs that you run, that even though they might run in July of twenty three, they're being paid for out of the twenty two budget because of the different fiscal years. Some some may be uh, that way, and some okay. may not. It, it depends when it started. It, it, there's a lot of different factors that the, the, the amounts are split. Uh, some of that money may have been moved in the past, I don't know, a couple of weeks or, or to, to, uh, to cover something else. So there's uh, lots of moving going on in the, uh, to try to make these things uh, uh, utilize the funds uh, that we have, the match funds. So when you get to the end of September and you have two years to spend the money and it's not spent, it then reverts. It then reverts back yeah. to the federal. Yeah. Which we, we, always, the we always spend our federal money uh, because yes. it, uh, we are probably now in FY22 federal, um, right, fe FY21 federal. There's so many numbers here. I'm trying to do it. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, gotcha. We, we well, we're well into that and we'll be switching over to FY22 anytime. And then 23 will start in October, but we don't touch that until a year or so down the road. Because we don't so, need it. <laughs> because we don't need it. So, so, and all, all federal, all state, all VR agencies are pretty much in that same mm -hmm. predicament. Uh, as a matter of fact, some agencies were asking RSA if they could have that two years be extended to three years. Right, carry it over. Uh, but but uh, they absolutely were not biting on, on that one. So it is two years to spend, um, you know, a year's grant. Okay. Uh, any other questions uh, from the SAB on FY22?
Okay, so uh, uh, if not on the FY23 budget, uh, I'm looking at it and I made a little bit of a mathematical mistake. We'll talk about that in a sec second, but in the 001 account, it went up about, it appears FY23 guy over the FY22 guy, the 001 account went up 540,000. Yeah. What, what is the reason for that increase? Yeah, some of, some of that, I, I want to say like 480 of that is because they move, they being HHS and A&F moved the rent. So the rent cost shifted back into this line item. Um, so if you look back two fiscal years ago, the rent line item was back here. So this puts it more in line with where we were then so i think that's a big part of the reason okay so that's just internal state bookkeeping that's the large majority of that 580 that you mentioned it's the large majority of it my understanding is the other uh 100,000 and Chandra's not here she's away on vacation but i had a conversation with her about this i think is attributable to some movement in personnel where we had payouts. And then there's another thing for some stuff that we had, some administrative stuff that we had to do. Like we had to get, we got some standing desks, we got some chairs and it's fairly, it's fairly low, but I'm saying like a bunch of things like that, when you add it all up, that's the remaining hundred. All right. And then when I look at the 1000 account, and somehow uh, it, it appeared that it was down 280. That was a mathematical mistake I made. It's actually down $430,000 when you okay, strip good. out. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you said that because that was a question that I had. Yeah, I transposed the, the number. I originally got the number off the state <laughs> website and I transposed the numbers. Okay, so because the, the, the number I have is 431,866. Yes, correct. Is that the survey? um no no that's what we were just talking about that's the movement of the rent from one to the other the oh so the, it's a it's a it's a movement of the rent within mcb's budget not yes outside yes. okay okay all right okay now that's less remember for the public following along that's less the earmarks that went out to tick the other main network members in the assistive technology earmark. The assistive technology earmark is 850. TIC in the, in the main networks is 850. No, it was 850 a year ago. No. That's what I'm saying, comparatively. And now it's the million, it's the right. assistive tech earmark. Yeah. All right. And it's like 1.1 million for the radio reading services. Yes. They call them the self's main network now, the Massachusetts Audio Information Network. Yeah. Um, just sort of an overall question. So I, as far as the numbers themselves, I don't have any other questions. Thank you for the clarification. Do you have enough resources to fulfill this budget? Do your vendor partners have enough resources to fulfill this budget? Absolutely. I think we're over-resourced in terms of money. I think the thing where the challenge is, is the language. John and I just had a discussion this morning. We had a discussion previously with Chandra, with HHS legislative on this, in that first they said that we couldn't work with any, we can only work with nonprofits now, apparently. Any for-profit organization, we're, we're, we can't use this money on that, which is, that makes it a challenge because some of what we were doing were was through organizations that are not necessarily nonprofits. Additionally, the way they put the language, the interpret, interpretation of the language is, we're asking each other internally, what do you mean? So we've, we've put requests to try to get clarification on what they were seeking, because we wanna to try to fulfill the legislature's wishes. But John, do you wanna, do you wanna edify further on a discussion this morning as to the other services that we were talking about? Yeah, this, um, 
Yeah, so, so the nonprofit language um, obviously is going to present a barrier to a for-profit entities who might be interested, who might be able to do some of those training activities. Um, true that majority who are uh, our partners are nonprofits that are providing direct services, but there is uh, for-profit companies that, that we work with that, uh, that provide training and trainers are hard to find. And when you start limiting the number of companies that you can buy the training services, the computer training services from, you're sort of uh, putting certain parts of the state at a certain disadvantage. So that was an issue that we discussed. Also, it seemed to be, the language seemed to imply a lot of, that it was for technology or, um, uh, and didn't stress very much on the other services that come along with adjustment to blindness training. So um, that may lead uh, some uh, folks who want to bid on the RFR to believe that those are not uh, available here. So um, it seemed to be very heavily stressed on technology and it seemed to be, which is important, and is good, but it also you have to, if you want to expend this kind of money, you know, it's very difficult for these vendors and we are going to have some leftover funds from this year because there were not enough clients or enough personnel at the agency level to fill, um, to spend the entire money, uh, entire pot of money. So therefore uh, the pot of money has been increased. And um, so we'll, We'll see if there are enough consumers to fill this this need um, that has been um, placed here, and uh, we'll work hard to find everybody we can. Um, and but it is it is a substantial increase from the training dollars that were allocated last year, so it will be a challenge to find enough people to take advantage of all that training. So, so, so what's interesting is, you know, I, I did read the, the language in the state budget and the earmark, and mm -hmm. it was quite clear that independent living skills, uh, uh, which included rehabilitation and the provision of accessible devices and so on and so yeah, forth. No, no. So that, that was pretty clear. Now, now there's a specific ear, uh, uh, set aside of like 700,000 between the Carroll Center the Mass Association for the Blind. Mm -hmm. So that's a carve out. I would assume that if either one of them had capacity, you could go over that amount. They could participate in this in this RFR for the remaining three hundred thousand. Well, we put it out, and we'll see who who uh, is interested in it. Um, yeah, I mean. But just, it's, to be, it's just to be clear, gonna be, it's going to be difficult based from based <laughs> from the past couple of years of earmarks. Uh, it's it might be challenging for some of these uh, for all of these funds to be utilized. But again, I, it's my I, it's my opinion that it might be challenging if the vendors uh, put that forward. They may have other strategies that but yeah. number of consumers that uh, have gone. Uh, in some years have been repeat consumers, which is fine. So this year, it might be a lot of repeat consumers. They'll have to find more consumers to, to fill that amount. So right. hopefully it all works out and we'll do our best to find those consumers for them. The, all right, the, I mean, it, lo um, it looks like you will have spent the 850, but I'm sorry, Amy, go ahead. I was gonna ask, um, when I read the language, um, it was unclear to me that it looked like independent living skills could encompass more than just technology are you no, interpreting it's, that no to it, it's there it's no it's it's there services is mentioned other services are mentioned it's okay. fine i'm just saying it's it's a lot of a lot of money based on okay. the language that we had last year and the the struggle that we saw some of the vendors have to reach that amount whether because they don't have enough consumers they don't have enough trainers they didn't have enough resources in place. Uh, the sense that the pot of money was increased, I'm hoping that the vendors are able to uh, find consumers and have enough staff to meet that extra 
um, level of funding they just received to provide those services. Understood. Do you know when the money will be available? Uh, so that, was a, Maybe. that was a tremendous impediment last year. Yeah, probably October. So again, it's going to be October, not until then. So we will have gone through an entire uh, a full uh, July, a full quarter of the year without the capacity to spend the money. By the time it gets transferred and loaded and you know all the things get responded to and everything else, maybe the last week of September. But but just to just to back up for a second, maybe, and I guess this is for the general public's edification. So the state budget is a law. Yeah, it's a budget document, but it's a law. So in the law now, it says it's prescribing how MCB must spend the money. So unlike if we had it generally, what we could do and the flexibility we would have, now we don't have any of that flexibility. So now we need to make sure we spend that money with those organizations, but we don't know what ratio that is. We don't know how much of it is, like they didn't specify like this percentage on independent, this percentage on, on assistive technology, like all those types of things. So that hampers our, that, that makes it more difficult for us. So what we're probably going to do is try to spend that money first and leave the other money that we have that doesn't come with all of those prescriptions as, as flexible money that we can move around as we, as we need be. But now we're gonna need more transfers. Those transfers take time. They take projections, which means you need data, which means, you, you know, so all of that. So I think in their effort <laughs> to try to be more specific, it actually makes it more difficult. So I, I want to go back to the, so let's say that you award contracts for the other $300,000. Uh, you get in, in this so, two-part so question. So you know, they won't be. It won't be three hundred thousand dollars, Joe, because to to satisfy. So we we just released an RFR for two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Because because to satisfy the demand of the technology that's going to have to be bought, we had to use one hundred thousand to buy that technology because the all kinds of requests start coming in for extra technology that that we would have run out. Our technology director advised us that if this level uh, if this level of funding uh, went through and that based on last year and the year before that the, the number of requests that come in for, for laptops, for iPads, for, for different items that cost a substantial amount of money, they, he said that he would be out of money and we would not be able to manage this. We had to sort of manage those requests towards the last month or two on the equipment side. So we had to hold 100,000 for equipment, so the tariffar that you'll see on the street that's available now is for two hundred thousand. All right. So, yeah, my my we point to, is I mean, to, to meet this demand for training because every time we send someone to a vendor, the vendor comes back and says, "Well, they need a laptop, they need an iPad, and we have to provide that iPad." I, I, so, I got it. Okay. Here's 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 the question: You yeah. award whatever you do for the balance. Well, let's say it's two hundred thousand, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. If those vendors are not able, they don't have the resources to provide the services, do you have the ability to shift that money to the Carroll Center or the MAP fee? Because perhaps somebody else has got the capability to fulfill uh, the service. So if a vendor, they'll indicate that on the RFR response on how much they are bidding for so they may go for the two hundred thousand or they may go for a hundred thousand uh or may go for fifty thousand we don't know so at at the halfway point we can look at them and say hey you haven't spent this yet um we, can we pull this back do you believe it and then maybe we can re rfr it again or maybe we can move it to other vendors without going through that process again that's something that we <coughs> discuss on the fiscal side to see what logistically or what legally we can do to move those funds around. And then I, so, I heard you, I heard, I think David say that you can't 
the money isn't going to start to be spent till October. If you already have agreements with Carroll Center and MAPFI, can't referrals be, be made to them now? Yes. So you can start spending that money now. Yeah, yeah. So, well, so we'll encumber the money and we'll start the process. When the check physically gets deposited in their account is another thing. But yeah, we have I mean, relationships, longstanding relationships. Yeah. So, yeah, so, right so you can you can provide the services. They they can send you a bill and they might have to wait to get paid. Right. So right. so right right now the Carroll Center is fully engaged with youth. And so they probably would not be available to take uh, and I've seen they've been taking some VR referrals already. So they would not be available to take any any uh, referrals for the uh, earmark money until at least uh, late August. Uh, early 1st of September at the, at the earliest, I believe, but I don't, I haven't discussed that exactly uh, with them yet. We, uh, we do have a meeting uh, coming up with, uh, with CCB, right, David, coming up soon or somewhere we along do. the way? We're in process of scheduling it. Yeah. And same MAVV. Because we're trying to coordinate like four different providers and different people's schedules. Yeah. And MAVV is, is still catching up on payment, uh, uh, submitting payments for last year. So, yeah, I mean, we can we can start accepting the referrals. So it's a good time to start looking for consumers. And then uh, we those those two earmarks are not being RFR'd. Those are different than the actual two hundred thousand that's being that's on the RFR. Right. Any other any questions from the the SAB on the budget? None for me, Joe. Thank you. Amy, Kim, Howard. Thank you. You've answered my questions. All right. Thanks. Well uh, Thanks. Update on the consumer survey. Yeah, I think you're referring to the assistive technology survey. Yes. Yep. So that's going well. Uh, we're partnering with HSRI on that. And the survey is voluntary. It's anonymous. Uh, we have a sample of consumers that we're collecting information from. And when I say we, it's actually our vendor, HSRI. And I think additionally, there's a different sub vendor there who is like, actually we're using like their system to like make the calls or whatever. Um, so we hope to use the information to improve our services. I know Mr. Pooler is very pleased with how the survey came out. He worked hard, him and his team worked hard on it and with HSRI. So we think it's a really good survey that will help inform us and help us adjust the programs and services that we deliver. Uh, because we know the nature of our consumer base is evolving and has evolved significantly uh, over the past few years and even longer. You know, I think John will probably tell you when, when he started the, the nature of the technology then is was much different than it is now, right? So we're trying to get in touch with that. So if you want, I have particulars, like there's um, right here, consumers from random sample uh, are being contacted. Consumers who choose to participate in the survey can respond in one of the following three methods. They can either use an online through SurveyMonkey, which is accessible. They can do a telephone interview where consumers uh, will be you know, communicated with over the phone, and then they can get a large print hard copy in the mail if they choose that. And the consumer, the consumer's name will not be linked to their responses or the results of the survey. So it's only going to be aggregate only. So this is a completely like anonymized thing. Uh, we did receive some questions from staff and consumers about the survey. Uh, from the, the sub vendor, again, the main vendor is HSRI, but they have this sub vendor called Knowledge Services uh, because I guess Knowledge Services were coming up on some of the caller ID for some of the consumers. They had questions around that. So we clarified that. Um, so it's in process now. And by all accounts, it's going very well. All right. It, 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 how is that survey being paid for? Uh, I think that's, we used, I'm trying to remember, 
if it's prorated jaunt, did we use some VR in some state? I wasn't involved in that. I think I think thing. there might be a share there. I, I'll let, I'll ask. I can ask and clarify that. So, so majority of majority of it is is VR. Yeah, um, but there might have been a, some SR because although VR has been the the big uh, technology consumer. Right. Uh, as we go forward with these earmarks and more training is being delivered, uh, we've been using every bit of the SR dollars. Uh, right, because we did want to capture SR responses. Right. So, but I forget what it is. If it's so, eighty, so twenty. Majority, yeah, majority. It's it, it, it's real uh, dollars. Yeah, I think it. I think, but I don't know. Was all of it? I'm trying to remember, John. I, I wasn't involved in the fiscal end. I don't. I can. We can find that out and report back. Yeah, please do. Uh, it's not being taken from consumer services. I'll tell you that. Yeah, all of this is like reallotment dollars or yeah. extra funding that came free from some unused contract that could not be able to be moved to anything else. Um, there's been no no, you know, cut to any consumer services that we purchase or any consumer services that we buy supplies for, like we have teaching, mobility, those sort of services. Um, anything has been taken from other services that were not being utilized and was sort of restricted in which way they could be moved. Okay. Uh, questions from the SAB? Okay. Update on the partnership with the National Industries for the Blind. Amy, did you have a question? I just saw you came off mute. No, I not Oh, okay. Yeah, they came in last week. We had a good meeting with them at MCB. They flew in from Washington, John and I. John, you want to give them the details? Sure. John's been the project manager here. So we'll uh we had the that that outreach meeting, as you guys remember, and then we out of all those consumers, we gave them about 14. They selected three. And three of those have gone through the program. Uh, two, one has completed, the other two are going to be completing um, by the end of August. So uh, we're looking to see, um, so they're developing this and they're they're making a lot of adjustments as they go along. And they're looking at reaching out to other states in the fall to two or three other states along with us to see if we can bring more consumers in. And um, so far, they're, they're, again, it's been a learning process for them. They haven't done this type of thing before. They're starting to realize the types of supports that these individuals uh, who want to be entrepreneurs would need. Um, they're starting to look at the different uh, characteristics or the different traits that they have or the different uh, skill sets that they have. So it's been a real learning process. I think it's going to help them a lot when they, they pick the next cohort of, of uh, entrepreneurs that come in. So one of the individuals has a, a tremendously successful sales career before she lost her vision. So they, they are actually looking at her, bringing her in uh, to NIB in some way and having her help them develop the channels and the different uh, supports that are going to be used uh, for the entrepreneurs in the future and to help them sort of uh, plan, I don't know, the different aspects of how they're going to support the entrepreneurs, even even the whole sales scheme of like commissions and uh, how, how um, you know, the, it, there's going to be funds generated from all this work. So this is like, again, something real new and they're learning. So they, they're thinking that she might be a very valuable to them in that, in that way. Uh, the other two, um, they see some capacity that uh, one, they're very strong, that he's, he might be a good entrepreneur. The other individual uh, is um, very interested and has really enjoyed the program, uh, but is uh, not sure yet. But they, she thinks she's going to give it a shot. And um, because she's learning about, she's learned what it would be to be a, a, an entrepreneur and starting this this type of online business. If if she doesn't go on her own, they're thinking of partnering her with the other individual, um, and then that would give her uh, more time to learn and and 
uh, she had a different career to, uh, in education and a sort of uh sales is not her thing she's been always interested in having a business and and so that's why she she got into the program she did very well in all the programs that they offered and did very well through the courses um but is is learning some things about herself that's um sort of help having her have some second thoughts about this and and that's something that's very hard to control uh, and manage because they don't they don't know these consumers that well. And, and many of the, these consumers have been, have tried other things at MCB and have received a variety of different services. And some of them didn't have a clear career path. So a lot right. of this training is to help define that career path and see if they have those soft skills. They want to be a, a business person, but do they have what it takes? And, and so if they realize that they do or they don't, or maybe they want to work in this field, but maybe they want to work for another entrepreneur uh maybe start that way first before they go on their own but they have all the skills to work the platform they've gotten all the marketing and sales training they've gotten the the, the technology training that they need and they have to pass that to go on to those other courses and they're going to have an opportunity to sort of uh, learn from um, different areas of nib or observe so that they can see how the the operation works that would be supporting them so it's um, yeah. it's a learning process. Yeah, it, it, it seems to be that way. So it seems that that individual that might uh, affiliate themselves with NIB, part of that will be actually channel development, and it would be identifying those opportunities that might make sense for the skill sets that people are training for. Right. right. So we really don't have an end goal for these people as of yet. That they have an end goal that they were hoping that they would be ready to go and start an entrepreneur, start uh, being an entrepreneur in their area, and they have sales tips for them, but uh, it's sort of like starting a business from just cold, you know, without any real supports. And so they're thinking they're looking at that now that how they're going to be there to support the individuals, um, and it, it does require some like local sales uh whether you call or businesses or whether you knock on their door or whether you attend chamber of commerce it does require some development on the low on your end so that you bring new clients into the uh where you'll make your money from from the the items that they're ordering so it does require it's not just online <clears throat> it's a combination of online and direct sales so that the platform that delivers is online and the, consumer, the clients can order online after you bring them in, but uh, and everything will be direct ship, but you do have to bring uh, the customers into the business and that's uh, that requires some skills uh, and uh, the ability to get around and talk to people and, and research where some of these businesses are. Uh, also, some work is being done on registering the individuals as a disabled owned business. Mm -hmm. so that they may have priority uh, uh, at, at, at some or have be notified of, of some contracts that are available through the state um, and take advantage of that uh, situation. So there's a lot of things being explored, a lot of different ideas, and these will all be rolled out. And uh, as time goes on, we'll see it develop and see how it goes. Yeah, so j just so I'm clear, though, I mean, that what those opportunities are is still I don't, I don't know if holy grail is the right word but you know people are getting the skill sets the desire they they came into this with some pre-existing skill sets they're getting the training but mm -hmm. we just don't know what those opportunities are that that's right. what needs to be baked right so they're trying to lead them to be entrepreneurs but some of them don't want to own the lemonade stand they just want to work the lemonade stand right so that's one of the things we're trying to figure out is how to now adapt it because the program was originally geared towards be your own boss you know you're the business owner now they're hearing they want like no I, i'll work this but i don't want to be responsible for all of it that's a little bit of a different thing Right. And, and they, they have the, the the inventory, you know, the products would be office supplies, cleaning supplies, all kinds of uh, you know, garbage bags, whatever you might need in an office. But I think what's also messed them up a little bit is that people are not returning to the office as they, they right. were before the pandemic. And that means that maybe you're going to be ordering 
fewer supplies for your staff than what you would have done before. Right. Um, so there, there's some factors I think that, that have thrown a little monkey wrench in, in both sides. And they're learning about the different types of consumers they're getting. Uh, and so Me meaning they being NIB, NIB, NIB yeah, right, and, and right, as, right, we, right. as we work in other states, uh, you know, the, the consumers are going to be a little different. I mean, so, um, so they're going to have to sort of have the training components matched up. They, they have a, they're doing a, a bunch of screening, uh, before to try to screen people out. And this is why we referred 14 and they only took three of them. So, can I, um, can I ask? Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question about that? Mm -hmm. um, you referred 14 and they only took three. Did you learn something about um, who you thought would be ideal and who they thought? It sounds like having a prior sales history well, was important. Yeah. Was there, were there other things yes. that you observed about well, how so, you might refer? So because this job doesn't have a salary base, it doesn't have and it's really for someone who wants to be an entrepreneur. Our councils were having difficulty identifying folks for us, for us that were interested. So we we set up a, a where we emailed so we, social media and uh, the counselors emailed their consumers, the active consumers, and asked you know asking if they were interested. And so that's why we held this public meeting, that even consumers who heard about it through the social media part came to it. So. It was pretty open-ended because we don't have, we know who wants to be entrepreneurs. Some of our Randolph Shepard vendors expressed some interest. Um, they're entrepreneurs already, but uh, it's very hard to, because the first thing to ask is, where's my startup money? Where, where's my inventory? How much what am, am I going to make? Yeah. How much am I going to make? And it- Well, how much are you going to sell? can't answer any of that, unfortunately, because we don't, we don't know how much they're going to make until we have one client that starts it. And gets involved in it and then we we see what kind of um you know success they have and then we can say well we have one client that's making fifty thousand a year or we have one client that's making one hundred and fifty thousand. so we don't have a lot of that information to help us sell it so it's a training program with an opportunity and it's an organization nib that's committed uh mcb is committed to it uh to support them on the vr side so it's uh so we put it out there and uh you know, more than we, I think we had like 25 to 30 people on, on that call, on the Zoom call. And we asked people who were interested to please stay after the meeting was over and they got the explanation. And uh, NIB was with us at that meeting and we took down those individuals' names and we, um, uh, you know, referred them to the proper personnel at NIB and they the ones who did the screening. And they chose the individuals of the folks they they thought. I mean, so we're in the VR business. They are trying to be in the entrepreneurial business. They're in the sales business. So they are the ones who should be selecting the people that are they feel will be the appropriate for their program. And so, and, therefore, and, that's and in yeah, terms of, have, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I understand. I guess I understand that. I guess I'm, there were 14 that mm -hmm. were referred mm -hmm. or that fit, and they selected three. Okay, so so they were select there. Well, let me. Um, were of the. I I understand you you described the three, but were there things that they um, automatically screened out, or something that you can learn about what their perception is of who's ideal for this that helps you market so, this? So they actually they actually selected about six or seven of them. What they did is they had them go through a assistive technology uh, screening. Uh, through a contractor that they use in Texas. And the the contractor took those uh, six or seven individuals and screened them out and said, no, they don't have the technology to eat, to eat, do this type of uh, okay. training or even to operate a business on their own. So some of those have come back to us and we have sent them to the Carroll Center to get additional training. Uh, they may come back and try it again on uh, in the next round. Uh, but they'll always be screened by this other vendor that will make that decision to see if their if their AT skills are even good enough to do what needs to be done in this program. So um, you're basically looking for, or they're looking for people that might have a sales history or some evidence that they could have the skill set to run a business, some AT skills. Was there uh, anything else? Um, they, they were looking for people who had 
uh, like one of our, our guys, the one that made it through. I'm trying to think what he's working part time. I think he's a masseuse part time and he wanted to get into this and he he wants to his main interest. I mean, he'll sell the other products, but his main interest is to sell products um, that are health sort of uh, related uh, to to consumers and market that. Um, so it, again, it's it's very difficult because I, it, these clients have so many different interests that it's it's hard to to uh, to really nail down. I mean, it's uh, a lot of those consumers that came to that meeting were consumers that had tried other things at the agency, other careers, and hadn't made it. Some had open cases, some didn't have open cases, and we opened those cases and gave them extra training, and some have reopened. So it's um it's very it, we still don't have an actual profile of the person yet because so they pick three and one of those three they want to retain and put into a some type of channel type development project and that'll be employed by them so now we have two that's not going to give us a large sampling so this is why they're looking at, uh, at bringing like two or three other states in uh, if we had like nine people that they were putting in and we could evaluate a larger group that would be better but you know when something is new it it moves very slowly and it takes time to develop the knowledge base that we can actually say it's this type of person i mean obviously our, our college graduates they're not interested in this they they need to go get a job or they want to get a job they have a college degree unless they got a degree in, in some kind of small business or biz, uh, business development or MBA and they have dreams of uh, going into this business, uh, into a business on their own. Uh, obviously, yeah, we're open to all that, but that's not the candidate we got when they you know, we had our open meeting and majority of the candidates that expressed. I think uh, I think a couple did have college degrees, um, uh, but most had been doing some kind of work. Some had um, been open with the agency, and because of uh, challenging health conditions, uh, did not pursue an employment goal. Uh, we had one that one of the, that was selected that they were planning to bring him in. He was going to uh, work this program with his wife. He became ill and he's dropped out of other programs at MCB because of his other conditions other than vision impairment. So there's a lot of factors that uh, play into this and uh, uh, and they they are learning about some of those factors at this point because they're used to working with people who are visually impaired in businesses, but they, it's a different skill set totally than what they're used to, to working with. And it's a, certainly a different, um, something they're trying to learn how to make it work for entrepreneurs who are blind. You know, yeah, the one so thing I, I think... I'm wondering, <clears throat> thank you, Joe. Um, do you feel it's still worth the effort to pursue this with them? Oh, it's it's certainly a, it's certainly a VR option that we want to give to our consumers. Um, it, it, we work with them as as any other vendor we would work with that comes to us and has a training opportunity with a with a, a potential employment opportunity at the end. And we make sure the clients understand that that if you don't make it through this these four classes, uh, it's probably not going to work out for you. Um, they're not going to let you use their system. So it really is based that. They're going to give you the some of your basic inventory and then anything else you bring in and they're they're very open to you finding other products like if you found a local potato chip company that that you want to work with and you're going to sell potato chips to wh whatever local businesses ca uh, by large orders they they're fine with that you can go ahead and do that um but you know you have to figure out your own shipping and the distribution and all that sort of thing they're also thinking about bringing other sort of uh, uh, online distribution platforms to their uh, to work with uh, their website or their system. That, that's something that brought up, was brought up briefly that they're looking at that. So it's it's a, a baby ongoing project. We're just getting started. It's uh, any program that MCB is involved with from the beginning. It it has its its uh, its growing pains and. Uh, Everybody learns as we go along and hopefully uh, we have, I mean, we always have consumers that come to us and, and, and have ideas of starting a business, but oftentimes is that they need to generate income 
or they don't have the income to to start this business. So this will be a very relatively very small income uh, or rev, you know expenses to start this, and we can help cover some of those uh, if needed. And uh, NIB is going to be there to support it uh, also with their folks. Like NIB is going to help them uh, with getting their business registered as far as helping with the paperwork and that sort of thing, of doing some of that research uh, as a uh, getting the business registered as a, uh, a uh, disabled owned business. Um, so we talked about the state use law that, that they're looking at and, and we're looking at. So there's, there's many different uh, options that we're trying to look at. And, but it, you know, we only have at this point the three that we sent forward. So we're we're limited on the individuals that we're working with, and we'll we'll see who comes back for the next round. We we feel some of those that were selected for the training will come back. We'll see if they can pass the screening again if they've improved their their training skill their computer skills. Yeah, I mean, just kind of one one reminder, and then then a comment is that. NIB's interest in this is furthering the distribution of the products that they deal with. So while they would, they, they're okay with an entrepreneur adding lines, uh, part of the price I believe is for them to use NIB type products. Obviously. And, yes. Obviously. And then the, the, the second, and, and most of them benefit, most of the products that they sell benefit from some degree of set-asides which we right. don't benefit from in Massachusetts. Uh, and just kind of the second thing is, I, I you know, I, I, this is one of these not, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I think it's looking for another avenue. I think it's a good idea, but hopefully not a, a lot of the burden is falling on MCB to find the opportunities. I hope the NIB is putting time and effort into this especially in identifying and, and helping to set up an entrepreneur in a, in a business. For all the reasons you state, John, you know, mm -hmm. it's tough to get going and that, you know, the seed capital to get going is not going to be insignificant. It goes beyond buying inventory. So mm -hmm. that's sort of my two cents. Okay. No, we agree with you. And this is why, you know, it, it looks like it's moving very slowly here and, it is because it's something new and it's something that's, again, they're, you're right. They're trying to increase their sales, obviously, but they, along the way, if we can find some entrepreneurs that they can make a living out of it, um, that'd be great. Yeah, I guess I, I'm not thinking it's moving slowly. I think it's a pilot initiative that you're, as you say, a baby initiative or in its infancy stages. I'm, I'm following up, Joe, with you of, you know, when does the pilot become something you want to build on and there's a some sort of return to you without um, more investment than return? And when does it become something you walk away from? So we don't have to answer that right now, but I, I'm, as I'm listening, uh, I'm not so much interested in the specifics as I am in the decision making at MCB about how long you want to test it out, what's your take on whether it's worth pursuing or not. Um, and that's not something to figure out now. It's still early, but um, it does seem like it's it's going forward. Okay. Yeah, obviously, the ultimate goal is to have consumers make an income that can allow our counselors to close their case as a successful, successful placement. So, you know, if we keep working on this and two, three years down the road, that's not happening, then it may be time to, under, you know, uh, move on yeah. and continue to look at other 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 opportunities. I, I This is the first one. I'd say we keep trying it for a while because the Internet's not going away. Right. This is only going to expand. More importantly, it only takes one. Once one person shows that they can make a good living off of doing this, other people will naturally flock to it. I'm sure of that. All right. Uh, why don't we move on? Just the last uh, piece before we get to program updates is uh, update on any plan for the Department of Revenue to get information on blindness status directly. Yeah, we're still waiting. We met with the DOR and 
you know, they're, we're waiting on their system to get multi-factor authentication. So once that happens, we can start using that. We have been in contact with the assessors. Um, the good news is we did hear from DOR that our ID card will suffice for the abatement. Uh, like you're not gonna necessarily need a certificate of blindness. You can use your blind ID card that we give and get that to your assessor and the assessor will use that. So that was good news, we got that, so. Okay, good. Uh, program updates, uh, dashboard on registration process and outcomes. And Susan, if you don't mind uh, jumping in on this. Yep. Do you want me to share the screen or? Yes, thank you. Okay, can everyone see this? And yes. The dashboard summary as of 8 9 22. Nate is away today. Our Springfield region is having a picnic. So he's out there at that. Our, our team out there is having a, a picnic. So. Um, so this will go over the calendar year registrations. Uh, as you can see, we're We've had a good amount of registrations here, uh, seemingly because things are starting to open back up and people are getting seen by their doctors and all of that types of stuff. So that's here in E7. If you look at E7, we have 1,317 year to date in 2022. For all of 2021, we, have we had 1,243. So as you can see, we've already exceeded that number. So we're probably gonna be back to 2019 types of numbers. 2019 number was 1866. So we'll probably be close to that by the time we're at the end of the year. And that's um, calendar year for- That's calendar year, yeah. We think much of that's probably COVID related. <laughs> Uh, then below that, we have registrations and we break it down basically monthly. Um, you know, it gives you like a little bit. So the first one is quality control. So the next one is central registration. Next one is fax, mail, and email. And then the next one is needs verification. So those are all indicating where the registrations are in various parts of the process. Um, we're pretty well caught up. Matter of fact, I spoke with Nate yesterday and he said like, we're within this week. So in other words, if we got one on Monday, it might've already been entered. So we're, we're very well, and I put in air quotes, caught up. Like there's, there's no outstanding ones to speak of. Um, then the next we have open SR cases and we have that broken down by children, adults and deaf blind. Um, and we basically have it by month. Um, if you want to, you know, just do comparisons there. And then below that is a little bit of a VR dashboard um, where you can see the data that, again, by month, VR adults were up. And I think that, you know, when we talk about outcomes, you'll see that that's kind of translates as well. So closed SR, closed VR, so I don't know if there's any specific questions or comments. Not on this end, Sab? Uh, this is Amy. I have a, a comment and a question, um, please. Uh, the comment is just FYI, I'm beginning to get a flood again of complaints from people who, for whatever reason, are not getting their certificates of blindness. I know the commission, because Nate and I have been in constant contact, I know that there have been some that have been sent out by the commission, but they're not reaching people. 
do we uh, my question about that is do we know anything about why whether it's a post office failure have we, or something have we been able to isolate any reasons for this and my other question is um it stems from the fact that uh, we are getting a lot of referrals for people who are visually impaired, not yet legally blind, but who want to return or continue to work. And I'm wondering if there is a separate regist uh, registration process for that group or a special form that needs to yeah. be filled out. Right, so let's take the, the last one first, Rel relative to people who are not yet 2200. So our statute indicates that in order to get services from our agency, you need to be 2200 and or have a field of radius less than uh, 10 degrees. So it's a 20, 20 degree field total. So when it comes to VR, our VR grant says that we can deviate from that and we can provide people VR services as long as the eye care provider indicates that that person's vision is going to progress to a point where at some point they will be legally blind. So what I would say is on a case by case basis, we try to have a dialogue with those people and their eye care provider with the consumer and their eye care provider. If ultimately, because a lot of it is a judgment call if the eye care provider and the consumer feels that that's where their vision is trending. If their vision is trending that way, then we can get them enrolled in VR programs. But there's no special registration. Form. I mean, no. Amy, it's, it's the same form. Okay. Uh, the doctor is gonna put their visual acuity. And let's say if someone has RP, so that's a progressive eye condition. So right. by the diagnosis that they make, or someone is, has a diabetic retinopathy, um, so any, any disease that's progressive, it's clear, um, then they will be enrolled. So that means they cannot receive certificates of blindness. They can't get the travel ID. They can't get any of these other things, uh, but they can be enrolled to receive VR services. Right. And then whenever they do meet the determination, we enroll them and then they get all those services. And so we've done, uh, Outreach to the eye care community since I began as commissioner, it's, it's at an all-time high, I think, in terms of engagement. We continue to do it. And as a matter of fact, the topic of our next eye care community provider event that we're having uh, in the late fall is going to be around this topic, how they can get people with low vision services uh, at MCB and the, the the delineation because many eye care providers don't know that. So we're trying our best to educate the eye care community and get that information out there. So Amy, also, if the, the, the person is visually impaired and it's not a progressive eye condition, they can go and apply for services at MRC. Yeah, that, that's what I've, I've sent a couple of and, people. And they'll be served. Right. And then if, if things change and they become legally blind they because become of some, whatever, then they can always, we can always serve the same consumer and open a case with us and we'll take care of the legal blindness issues or they can stay with both organizations or they can let MRC close their case and we'll take over. But we can serve, both agencies can serve the same consumer, uh, getting them to a vocational goal. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask about the, the table that is closed VR cases that we have up? Um, yes. It says from November, or sorry, October 1, 2021 to February 9, 2022, I'm assuming that's just no. it till well, year to date. Well, the, the federal year now goes from July 1st through June 30th, uh, when WIOA was passed to, to, but, align us, to align our account with other government programs. They, I understand. Um, uh, I'm sorry, John. It's. Um, I think that's a typo to tell you the truth. I don't think that's supposed to be two nine. I think that's supposed to be uh, a different number. I think that's supposed to be like eight nine, oh two oh nine, two two. I think. 
So those numbers in 2022 column, 140 and 85, yes. those are as of August 2022. I believe no. so. I believe no. that's a, no, I no, believe no. that's a typo. Okay, so that that number is actually as of June 30th of 22. So the one oh, the 140 the 140 is the number of cases we closed successfully and the lower number is the number of cases we closed unsuccessful. Right, cuz John as there's a, a typo. Right. The date yeah. up top says 2922. That's 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 not correct. No, it's it's Yeah. It's so June that's 30. to June 30th 2022 correct we just filed yeah. that report so uh, we have um we have uh until like august 15th to file that report from april through june that's the got it paper. so yeah, we just I, filed it this week so what you have is that updated number 140 and 86 correct yes thank you so uh, those numbers aren't going to change uh, well we, no. we, we start brand new on july 1st Gotcha. So it looks like there was a small dip from 2021 to 2022. There was. In your closures. Correct. Um, so, so and your successful closure rate. Right. The way I I'm, I think is because we had a, well, it could have been 145 or 146, but we had some consumers that had technology issues and we were not able to close them. I, we, we're going to close them this quarter. Um, the also what I suspect is that we we had a lull in you know a lower number of people registering, so that our number of VR consumers currently active is lower than than you know, like say 2019. So that that having fewer referrals um, had um, I'm sure some kind of impact. Uh, you know, year and a half, two years, uh, not a college kid, but someone who came in looking for work or whatever, uh, that may have had an impact on on this uh, situation being a little lower this year. Understandable. I think in the chart itself, there's some typos and numbers aren't adding up. Um, uh, you know, 145 plus 80 equals 214. There's something, there's something here in the math. There was, uh, yeah, it, yeah. The, the column, the, the, they need to be corrected. For some yeah. reason, the columns didn't foot, didn't foot correctly. So, yeah. so the 145 was, I, I think, the system grabbed some potentially eligible cases and it wasn't realized. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to go over these numbers with Nate, but uh, that's what we were looking at 145 to 150 and then realized that five of them were potentially eligible and being counted incorrectly. So we moved those out of the way. So 140, um, I, will, uh, I will spend some time with them next week and we will now have the, the 911s that we filed for the four quarters. And we can add those 911s up and make sure that they those numbers cor, uh, correspond with this and then we can we can uh, have those edited and, and fixed for the next meeting that sounds great john yeah because i think what you're saying is you're still working to correct some of the data and the numbers this table even without changing those numbers the columns yeah, because, aren't adding because up correctly. That, that, that 140 number from what i'm told well, again, I, I have to, the best way to figure that out is to add up the four quarters, uh, four, four 9-11s that we filed. And I'm not sure how Nate got to that 140. I think he was counting actual case closures, I, but uh, we'll we'll have a discussion next week on it. Yeah, it, understood. Uh, it's not just the 140, whether that's closure or not closure. It's like yeah, the, it's the 145 before, and all those others, yeah. Or, or 145, it's that the table has a total that's adding up the previous rows okay. and that total calculation is wrong. Okay. Okay. Well, so this, I think this table isn't, isn't fairly yeah. portraying what's happening in the outcome side. Okay. We'll take a look at it for okay. sure. Thank you. All right. Any, any new business? from the SAB, from the commission? No, overall, I mean, I think we're doing well. Uh, you know, right now we're in the midst of summer, so we've got a lot of vacation schedules and things like that. We've had movement. Uh, Mike, are you out there? Mike Ciccone, I do want to introduce our new director of communication. Mike Ciccone is here. I am here, Commissioner. Good afternoon. 
Mike, I don't know if you want to give them a good afternoon. I don't know if you want to give the SAB a bit of a thumbnail of your background. Uh, sure. So uh, for the past 10 years, I've worked in TV news, uh, two different television stations here in Boston, and I've made the switch to uh, join MCB, and I'm excited to be here and work with all of you, and I look forward to that. All right, good. Mike has been assimilating well, and he's a str very strong communicator. So we're, we're optimistic uh, on Mike long-term value to the organization. Good. Uh, before we turn it over to any questions from the public, uh, I believe on my calendar, the next meeting is on Friday, September 9th. At least it's on my calendar. I don't know if others have it on their calendar as well. Yes, I have it. Yeah. Hi, Joe. It's Regina. I do have that date as well. All right, good. Any questions from the public? Uh, David Kingsbury. Hello. Hope everybody's having a good summer. Um, great that you just uh, introduced your new director of communications because I have a request. Uh, there has been... Um, uh, some very positive recent movement at the Secretary of State's office on accessible remote voting. And uh, I'm wondering if it would be possible to organize a town hall with the MCB on voting procedures. Uh, it's probably a little bit um, uh, short notice to do that in time for the Secretary for the um, September primaries, but definitely in the fall, I think it would be great to do a town hall on. Um, voting procedures if you want to get an accessible online ballot. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm open to that in some way, whether it's a town hall or a special event or, you know, some type of thing. We've worked with Michelle Tassinari and uh, the lady's name over there. They have a person specifically for accessibility. We've worked with them and they've, they've you know, so I'm sure we could get them to go for it. Great. Okay, Debbie. Hi, yeah, good afternoon. I, I just have, I don't know if it's like questions or clarification, um, you know, and just strictly speaking as a consumer um, and listening to these meetings, sometimes it gets a little, I don't know if it's overwhelming or just frustrating um, to hear comments like how, overfunded or how much money the agency has and the money that they have or you know have been allocated and allowed does not get spent um, not only does it not get spent but even giving extra time like with the covid and i'm referring to that four hundred thousand dollars it's like a second chance here 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 spend it again still does not get spent. Um, and at the, I don't know, at the end of the day, I hear about all this money. I, I try to participate to petition the government to give us more money. Um, and then the money that we get um, is either not spent or in a, in a mad like rush of spending and frustration as to get spent in the last month or now it's you know you're saying September for some of this money so it's like six weeks and I, I just see such like gross inefficiencies with this whole system so I find that frustrating because I was lucky enough to participate in some uh, program directed at SR because so much seems to be weighted towards VR which I understand um, where money that everyone worked so hard for was in fact spent on a consumer, me, to be part of a program that educated and teach taught a handful of us. I mean, I think it was only six of us, um, some basic computer and phone and communication skills. And it was just so beneficial to these people and to myself. And we all indicated how we'd love to have like you know, the second round of this or the next step um, because it was just so, um, I, I don't know, it was just such a good use of the money and of our time and of, of the 
the institution, who, whoever it was that taught it to us. I, I just would like to see the money that comes in to the MCB and gets so you know, hardly fought for and given to us and, and you know, tax dollars and stuff spent in, in programs or spent to benefit the people who need it. And, and it seems, I mean, not only what I seem to get more of is surveys, which I'm not quite sure what they're doing, but then there was a survey about the surveys that never got surveyed. And there's $400,000 out the window. I, I just, from listening to all of this, I find that whole point very, uh, I don't know, kind of frustrating. And I would like to see the money that comes into the organization spent on the consumers and spent before the last five minutes of the budget and spent to help the people it's supposed to help. And, and I don't understand half the time what these surveys are doing, but the program and the six people who did the program that I did, it helped us and we're hungry for more. Um, and we're not VR people, but uh, you know we are members of the, the public and the, the Commonwealth and the, the investment in us is, is a worthwhile investment. So I don't know, that's kind of what I have to say. Debbie, thanks for your comments. Uh, just to clarify further, the money that we have difficult time finding programming and you know being able to spend all of it are in two specific accounts. One, the deaf blind extended support units where that is utilization driven, meaning that money is specifically programmed by the legislature to serve a very specific population. That population is people with deaf blindness and deaf with development, I mean, blind with developmental disabilities. So that's a very finite population. And the consumers, generally speaking, in that account are getting very significant services, oftentimes residential placement, round the clock, nursing, things like that. So one or two consumers coming in and out of that program can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if a, if a couple of people leave that program, like mid-year or partway through the year, that is a big amount of the quote-unquote unspent money. Additionally, then in VR, the VR money, the federal money particularly, comes with all kinds of laws and regulations, and you can't just use it on anything. You've got to use it specifically on people who are getting an employment outcome. That's, that's, that's it, right? The programs you're referring to, we spend all that money. All that money gets spent. Matter of fact, all that money gets spent early. And what John and I and Chandra and all the rest of the managers try to do, and what makes it difficult for us is then when the legislature comes in and prescribes it even further, because what we're trying to do is behind the scenes, move money from one account to the other appropriately, but trying to do all of the the behind the back of the house administrative work to be able to get money from one account to the other so that all of it can be spent so i hear your frustration if anyone wants to advocate for the legislature yeah more money it's it's less prescription on what the money is to be used for <laughs> that's the thing that's what makes it even more difficult John, so you have Dave, to add there? David, I was going to ask um, on on the VR funds, which appear not to be spent. Is there a backlog of consumers, or are we all caught up with the consumers? No backlog. John can speak no. better than that. But where where we are turning, we run events. Many of the events we run are trying to get people. Hey, come on! We're one of those agencies that most people don't want to join. Unfortunately, particularly people who are younger. They don't, you know, that, that they're, our first thing is to get them acceptance for blindness counseling, right? Once we can get them to do that, then we feel confident. But that is a huge thing. We spend a ton of time just identifying people that have lost their vision to first get declared legally blind 
and then to be accepting of the services. So, the, so there is no backlog, Joe. If if we had a backlog, we'd have to start talking about order of selection and all that. So uh, we talked about earlier how quickly people get registered these days, and they get a, a call from a, a council within within a couple of weeks or so. The application is done, uh, and then we start moving forward. So there is no no uh, backlog of individuals waiting. Uh, to receive any services or to start any vocational objective. That's and, and are the counselors, um, as they look at a consumer and let's say they went through a technology training program and, you know, I don't know how long the technology training program is, but let's say they get to the end of it and it would benefit the consumer to have another two or three weeks. We're this, sending them back. Well, you're no sending problem. them back. We yeah. approve it. Any, any, any additional request, if it comes out from the provider, and the consumer agrees, no problem. They go back for more. What would have been four weeks can be six weeks. They just tell us what you know, what addition, what additional uh, knowledge are they going to gain from that? Are they going to do no, additional, no, no. I got, Excel, I got, I, additional I Microsoft that. Word or PowerPoint, whatever it may may be? Uh, yes, no, we have no problem adding uh, additional training to any any provider that needs that. There's plenty of money, and if the consumer is willing. And the vendors able to is certainly have no issue with that. So before we uh, take Nona's question, uh, anything from the SAB on uh, Deb, what Debbie raised? Yes, and this is Susan Foley. I mean, thank you, Debbie. And it is, I think, something that's in the back of all of our minds, or maybe even in the front of all of our, our minds, is all the money that... Um, isn't spent for a variety, wide range and variety of reasons. And then you're in an odd position of asking for more money when you aren't spending out the money you were given and how to conform to the rules and how do you get people the most services um, that are the most meaningful for people. So I think it's one of the reasons why we're all in this game. I think it's frustrating for everyone to hear. And I, I would include people at MCB as well in this to how do you get the money spent so consumers get as many of the services that they need as possible? Um, I think we're we're hopefully um, coming, you know, as COVID levels out, we'll have a better sense of things, but I think it is a concern for everybody. So we're not asking. Thank you for, for raising more, it. We're not asking for more VR dollars. We have plenty of that. Uh, and we're not, uh, state dollars are being uh, offered to us through the earmarks. And we're getting uh, just very incremental raises on the 1,000 account. And when there's a new client for the DBS account, that's obviously covered. Um, so the consumers and the providers are the ones who are bringing that need. And we recognize there's an SR need. Um, and so if we are offered the funding, then we, the vendors are the ones who are providing that service. Uh, so. It's it's beneficial to the vendors and it's beneficial to the consumers. Yes, I think John, just to um, to say, but I think advocates are out there talking to the legislature to support services like MCB, and you might mm -hmm. not be out there asking for it, but I think it's a sometimes it's hard to walk that balance when there's some underspending or carry forward and advocates are asking for certain things, how they handle that. I know Amy and Kim, you have much more experience in that than I do. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think what I'd like to add here is that I know that, and I just, we've just heard how at the end of the fiscal year, um, you know, the technology funds were running out in terms of provision of devices. I would like to have seen some of the money that's been put toward surveys instead be put toward perhaps provisioning of devices. It couldn't be. It couldn't be. The money well, that was yeah. The money was that was running out was, was state provided funds. Right. And because the 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 earmarks increased the demand. So, so much more substantially, it was running out in like April, May, we had to sort of make selections, but it, that, and none of this VR allotment money, reallotment money can be used to I satisfy any of the senior need. I understand that. My question is, you now have an extra $200,000 available. 
is there any potential for increasing, and this is for SR consumers, for increasing the number of things which can be purchased? For example, there are a lot of people who have difficulty with reading, with reading mail, with reading um, paperwork, and so forth. There are some devices that are available um, that would help tremendously with that, but it yeah. costs money. Yeah, and the answer is yeah. yes. yes. There will be more OCR devices this year than there were last year. Yes. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. Um, and there were more this year than there were the year before. And then there were more that year before the year before. It's gone up every year. Since I've been here, we've done more technology every year. There was a question that was just asked in the chat. Um, what is an MRL? MRL? What is MRL? Let me see. An MRL? I don't know. I don't know what MRL is. MGL, yeah, I don't know either. general just... law. Oh, maybe MGL, Mass General Law. Oh, MGL, Mass General Law. All right, Nona, you're up. Yeah, oh, <laughs> thank you, Joe. Um, I, I have a, a question regarding the short and long survey. Um, I, 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 I was surprised to hear, is, are you saying that in order to, for new registrants, that it is incumbent upon them to complete a survey uh, this one of the surveys in order to register? Yeah, I think there might be a distinction over difference here, Nona, in that what we call the short form, which we're using generically the term survey, is now the uniform set of questions that we use to register new consumers. These questions are name, age, address, things like that like this these are not like in-depth questions these are mostly demographic questions that are on the short form i i know i i understood that um but you know there is the cost you know was mentioned that this um was the cost was four hundred thousand dollars to put this all together and and i'm just i'm concerned um about i mean i don't understand why it's necessary to have either a short or a long form um, for anyone to register. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter what your demographics are in order for you to, if you meet the criteria of the agency, blind or you know legally blind, um, for you to get services. So it, does it really matter? Because we've, we've heard about some of the questions that were originally in, um, on the survey. I mean, consumers talk, we, we hear these things. Rather and than talking abstracts, Nona, do you want me to read you the questions? Well, I no, no, I, I'm up. referring, no, I understand. I, I'm referring to the initial questions regarding gender and sexuality. And I, I that, that obviously concerned me. And I don't understand why questions like that would have ever been considered on a survey because I don't know what those what that information you were the the agency was trying to gather would have you know made any made any difference to someone receiving you know uh, services from an agency when they're blind or legally blind yep. so i guess so enough, i just have that concern sure let me explain it then just to be clear the short form which is our registration the questions we're asking during our registration process going forward Okay, the questions are, first question, date of birth, second question, gender, third question, race, fourth question, are you a citizen of the United States? Uh, fifth question, which best describes your immigration status? The race question, the immigration status question, we are required to ask. We had a finding in an audit because we weren't previously asking those questions. As part of getting our federal grant money, we must ask those questions. I go on. Number six, what's your marital status? Uh, did you serve in the military? Do you, what's your preferred language? What's your current living situation? What's your education level? What's your employment status? 
I mean, these are the types of questions that we're talking about here. Like these are very rudimentary. Then in the long form, they go into a little bit more depth as to, well, if you were, if you are employed or you were employed, what was the industry you were in? What was the type of job you had? Like that type of thing. In our statute, it is required that we produce an annual report. Do you know what the annual report was prior to being me, commission, me being commissioner? It was the amount of people who were legally blind in the Commonwealth by community. That was it. That was the extent of it. Now, and I get questions all the time from legislators, legislators, how many people read Braille? How many people use a cane? How many people have a guide dog? We don't know any of that information because we don't collect any of that information. We are now through these tools, which have been done, which we've worked with HSRI, which is one of the premier human services <laughs> Uh, demographers in the in the nation on this issue, we've developed these questions to try to get some of that data, which we think is going to help our consumers long term when we can understand the implications of it. Oh. We're going to try to put big data to use so we can help people. That's the goal. Sure. But could that data not also be supplied by your VR, SR, your transition counselors, your, you know, your RTs. I mean, that's all in their reports. I would assume they, they have that information on their clients as well. Not necessarily, and certainly not consistently. And our, and our, the system we have aware, which, you know, had I been commissioner, I wouldn't have gone with it. It's not a simple database to go in and just say, how many people do this, that, or the other? You have to export it to, to blow and do and pay a lot of money, we'd have to pay a lot of money to outside organizations to go in and try to find that data and try to read that data. We tried that route initially, and we recognized that that wasn't going to yield the results that we're, that we're seeking that would be valid. So that's why we went in this direction. All right, uh, Regina, there is a question in the uh, chat uh, for somebody concerning services, if you could uh, perhaps respond to them, it's, it's um, probably not for this, for the forum, but, but the, clearly the consumer needs some guidance. So if you would do that, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other business, any other uh, uh, questions from the uh, gallery? The SAB? Uh I had I had a question. Who's this? Debbie again. Oh, hi, Debbie. Yeah, sorry, I raised my hand again. Um, just a, like a follow up to what I was saying before. I'm just wondering if it isn't then either the jobs of the consumers or I would think more the commission or commissioner or the people in charge to maybe try to get um, I don't know what they're called, but get the money that we get, whether it's from the government, the state government, the federal government, um, to have less restrictions. And if there isn't, so that the money can be spent um, in directions that would be beneficial. And if there's a procedure or process by which to do this, and um, obviously to see the You broke up there, Debbie. Broke up there, Debbie. Debbie, what I will say is during my budget testimony to Ways and Means this spring, I indicated, please, could you just not put language in? Because the, the, the language that you put in, although well-intentioned, makes Excuse it more me. restrictive. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm not done. So uh, what I was trying to say is that when you guys are talking like this in all these surveys, I feel that as a consumer, I'm, I'm trying to be just put into a, a data box. Um, and that I, I think the focus, like they were saying, doesn't, doesn't your counselor know these things or that personal relationship with your counselor, which I find is so important because the, the questions that are asked on the surveys are not reflective of me 
and my needs and, and where I fit uh, necessarily. I, I mean, we don't all fit into the, the, the surveys that have been decided in some of these questions. And I feel that if the emphasis is put more back on the, on the personal relationship that the consumers have with their counselors, that, you know, that is where the work is done, which, you know, begs the question again is where are the counselors at? How much work do they have? Can they not deal with their clients because they have too many? And I don't know, that's just what I'm gathering from all of this. I don't know, I don't find it funny. Um, I, I really don't like a lot of these surveys because I feel that the, it's too much data because it's not, it's not putting out the picture of me and, and, and I'm here for the services. So I don't know, that's, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Anything else from the public? Last comments from the SAB? All right, with that, we'll uh, adjourn. Everybody have, enjoy the rest of the summer. Have a safe Labor Day, and we'll speak to you all on the 9th. Same to you. Thank Bye. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.